Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm loud today. Welcome uh, to our Savior, especially those of you who are watching from home. We're glad that you're with us on this gray and dismal day, but everybody looks pretty sunny in here. Yeah, and anybody that was at Chili Supper and made chili last night, thank you. There was more chili than I've seen in half a lifetime, I guess. I don't know. There's a lot of it, and it was very good. Thank you. Uh, as we begin our worship, I'd ask you to please stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise Him with exaltation. Praise Him in congregation. With grateful heart, I thank Him for His goodness. All the works of God are good and right. All his, all his deeds let us praise. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we plead for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all of our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God has has had mercy upon you and has given his only son to die for you. And for his sake, he forgives you all of your sins. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He who began this good work within you will bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you have sent to us your Son to be our brother and to take our place in the suffering that we might be saved. Deliver us from our captivity to sin, the tyranny of self and the temptation of the world that our hearts may be focused upon Christ and delivered from every evil. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise you up for you, a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb of the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 13. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things exist and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things and we exist through him. However, not all men have this now, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. 
but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, as he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of our gospel, which this morning is from the first chapter of Mark's gospel. They went into to Caper they went into to Ca they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, Who is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into the surrounding district of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess the faith to which we hold using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. See if there's anybody else here this morning. I'll, uh, if the kids are, are at home watching, why don't you come up closer to the TV and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ella, what's this? A remote. a remote. What do you use it for? TV. Do you know when I was a kid, we didn't have remotes? You had to actually get up out of your chair, go turn the TV on, and then switch to find the channel. But we only had three channels on these good days, so I guess that wasn't too bad. And then sometimes your dad would say, get up and change the channel. But then I didn't have a TV till I was in fourth grade. Can you imagine that? No. <laughs> Remotes are amazing things, especially this one, because it controls not only the television, but all kinds of other things. So if I push this button up here, what happens, do you suppose? Turns on, right? Yeah. And then I could uh, push this one, and the volume would go up or down. Push this one and the channel changes, right? Or if I know the number I want, like 249, I could push the numbers in and the channel would change. Then there's all these buttons down here that I've never figured out what they do, but that's neither here nor there. But then there's another one that I think is sometimes interesting to have. It's the one that says mute. <laughs> Sometimes I wish people worked but on remote control. <laughs> I have a feeling there's a lot of people that think the pastor should be on remote control. But the, these are very important things in our life because they control a lot of things. In fact, I have one now at home that controls not only my television, but my lights and all kinds of other things in my, my house. So that's an amazing thing. 
This morning, we heard about Jesus, who was in the synagogue. And he, we discovered, could control a lot of things. Because there was a man that was in the, ter- in the synagogue that morning, the church, and uh, he seemed to be possessed by an evil spirit. And Jesus was able to control him by saying, Spirit, leave him. And the spirit left him. Jesus has a lot of control. Do you know that Jesus wants to control our lives too? Not that he wants us to be like robots and that he can punch a button and we'll do whatever he wants us to do. But he wants us to know that we, he is in control. And so when things aren't going so well, and somehow we wonder, how's this all going to turn out? Well, we know Jesus knows because he's in control and he'll make it work. He likes us to know that he's in control and that somehow he is helping us to be the kind of people he wants us to be. To be loving and caring, sometimes to say the right thing or say something good to someone else. And so we give God thanks today that he's in control of everything and that we don't have to worry because we know God will take care of us and help us with whatever we need. Amen. And so now we go on by singing the next hymn. Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a feeling uh, that Sabbath in Capernaum was pretty standard, typical. Sabbath meals have been prepared the day before, and now everyone was getting ready to go to the synagogue. Mothers were probably yelling at their kids, come on, get dressed, we got to get out of here, we got to get to church. People have been talking about this rabbi all week in town, this traveling rabbi. And now we know he was staying with Peter, so maybe he'll show up today. Maybe the rabbi will ask him to talk. And so the town slowly trickles into the synagogue. How are you? How's your week? What's new? How's your mom? What's with the kids? What's how the grandkids? Did you catch the game last night? 
In other words, everything was just as normal as normal could be in Capernaum. Predictable. Everything was going just the way it went. And everyone figured that day worship was going to be like every other Sabbath. Nothing new, nothing changed. The rabbi would drone, people's minds would wander, and then it would all be over and they'd all go home and have a good meal and roast the rabbi. But the rabbi invited this Jesus to talk. And all of a sudden, it was not the typical Sabbath. Somehow his words hit the mark. He seemed to know the scriptures even better than the rabbi. In fact, he almost connected with them and their daily lives. He was like speaking to them directly. This was no monotonous lecture like the rabbi gave Sabbath after Sabbath, where he repeated things that other rabbis had said and said, well, this is what one rabbi says, and this is what the other says, and everyone, yeah. No, this was talking to me. His words were not what they used to hear. Not, this was not an average Sabbath service. The way he taught changed the way they saw the world. How they saw themselves, how they thought about God, changed, most importantly, how they wanted to live out their lives. Somehow what he said unsettled them. Made them a little uncomfortable, but then also gave them some hope. He taught with power and authority. And they're all going, where did this guy come from? Why can't we get him for our rabbi? I want to hear more. But they had no idea who he was. They wanted to know, where did he come from? How did Peter get to know him? Who trained him? Where does his authority come from? How come he knows the Bible so well? As so all those questions are floating around in the minds of the people, when all of a sudden in the back of the, the synagogue there was this disturbance. This man came up the aisle and he began to speak. And what he said was not what anybody thought he would ever have said. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And all of a sudden, the people are looking and going, huh? Who? What? The man was challenging this Jesus. And so everyone was shocked and stunned. They couldn't believe this was going on in their synagogue. And Jesus stood up and he looked intently at that man. And he said to him, Spirit, come out. And the dead the man was whole and healthy again. Talk about being shocked. And once again, all the questions were asked. Who's this guy? How come he can teach with such power? Where does he get this power? He can even control spirits. This crowd got a whole lot more than they bargained for that Sabbath. But I suppose like the synagogue people that went to church that day, Sometimes we come to church almost with the same attitude. Oh, we expect to pray. We are going to hear some Bible readings. We know that the preacher is going to preach for at least 15 minutes. But we don't expect anything really to happen. It's going to be the same old Sunday service with different hymns, probably a couple that we don't like at all. It's not going to be any different. Unfortunately, it'll be over in an hour and we get to go home. Sometimes we might expect, well, maybe one of the hymns will touch me today. Sometimes we think, maybe I'll get a little emotional because the, we'll hear a song that reminds me of a loved one. Or the pastor will say something that really touched me somehow. But I venture to guess that we probably don't expect much to happen when we're in this place. Because somewhere along in the history of the Christian church, we got the idea that worship ought to be very tame. That worship, and I suppose the church itself, ought to be for people who have got it all together, who somehow can just show up and make an appearance and let everyone else know, I'm with you, I'm a Christian. 
Nowadays, it's not evil spirits that upset us so much in church as much as the guy whose cell phone goes off. Or maybe it's the typo in the bulletin. Unclean spirits, haven't seen one of those. Worship is so predictable. In fact, you might be able to just sleep right through it. And in our Lutheran circles, it seems that if you sit in your chair, you ought to keep your mouth shut. There should be no amens out there, no preach on, preacher, no raising of your hands and singing of a hymn. That's for those Pentecostals. We should frown, not smile in church. And if you're coming from communion, you better have this pretty dour face. Somewhere along the line, we've decided to button things up, to close things off when we come to church. After all, worship ought to be respectable. It ought to be quiet. It ought to be predictable. We don't want any change in our worship. Remember way back when I was in college, all of a sudden there was a liturgical dance and, and these religious dramas and, and guitars and drums. And oh my, oh no, this is not the way church is supposed to be. In fact, in my day, men wore their suits and white shirts and ties to church. Women wore a hat and white gloves and pearls and no other jewelry. And every kid had his Sunday outfit that didn't change until summer. There were no exorcisms. There was nothing going on that was exciting. As a kid, I remember living for the moment when in the general prayer the pastor would say, when the night cometh and no man can work, I knew we were getting near the end. Sometimes I don't think we really appreciate the power of what goes on in this hour. If we did, I think we would be in awe. We live in a world where we're constantly putting up walls, where we're trying to keep people farther away from us. We can talk about best friends and being close to our spouse, but you know as well as I do, we keep a lot of us inside. We don't want anyone to know some of the hurts and some of the issues that we have in our life. We keep to ourselves. The apartment complex I lived in before I moved was almost a microcosm of our world. I lived with so many other people, and yet we all kept our distance. We might have said hi in the hallway if we passed, but to invite them in for coffee, I don't think so. So often that's how we manage our, our lives how we sometimes manage the way we try to keep distance from Jesus Christ in our daily life. Because we know when Jesus comes involved, things happen and things change. Because we saw that in the Bible. We saw it in the lesson this morning. We're not sure we want major change. Something might get set loose. We might be set free from something. Something could be exercised from us. Yet how often do we sit like that man in the synagogue, desperately hoping that something changes in our life? Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that any of you have been possessed by an evil spirit. But you know, we are confronted by things in our life that we cannot control. Things that have power over us and rob us of the fullness of life. Things that seek to destroy and not build us up. We're possessed by fears and self-doubts, and so often we even begin to hate ourselves and say, I'm no good. I can't do that. We're consumed by anger and grudges. Our life is a lot of habits and relationships that seem to be tossing and turning, and some nights it's hard to sleep. Old wounds don't heal. We're weighed down. We may not call them unclean spirits, but they are a hold of us. It's in all of our work to ensure that everything is good. Sometimes we try to make things quiet. We try to bottle them up. We try to keep our worship tame. We try to keep our worship on an, our life on an even keel. We'll spend more energy some days masking up what we're feeling or thinking than letting it out. 
But I think we need to remember that when we come into this room, there is a crucial truth. God is here. And he's doing awesome things to us. He comes to free us from everything that binds us, to transform our lives and to shape them into the life that God wants us to have. Oh, we may have slipped. Just think about what God is doing here in our midst. You and I come into this place full of a week full of mistakes. Well, we've probably messed up more things than one. We've, had, we've said things, done things, thought things that hurt others. We have broken God's law and haven't even thought about it. And if we did, we kind of minimized it. So we start the service by telling God we've messed up. And without making us go through a long list of the things we did wrong this past week, we merely have to admit to God that, yes, Father, I have sinned in thought, word, and deed. I have done the things I shouldn't, and I should have done some things that I didn't do. I've really made a mess of this week in some ways. And what does God do? Does he give you a long lecture on how you ought to be acting? Does he tell you that he is, you have really disappointed him? Does he tell you to bend over so he can spank you and send you to his, your room to think about what you've done? No. He listens to our confession and he embraces us with his love. He forgives us for the sake of his son, his son who was crucified for our sins, who paid the price for all the mess up we did this past week. He forgives us. And then for the rest of the service, there he is holding us in his lap, telling us how much through his word he loves us and how he's there for us. And somehow the Spirit keeps us drawing us closer and closer to him. And we may not even realize it, but somehow in this moment, God has decided to change our life. We're going to leave this room a little different than we came in. He'll remind us of all we've done. Hopefully we'll have a little more hope about what's going to happen in the week to come. A little more encouragement that we can do something good in this world. And then comes the greatest miracle you and I could ever experience in any week. Somewhere between me speaking and you kneeling at this rail. God takes bread and wine and enters in with and under it. He becomes personal in that bread and wine. He is really here. And it only gets better because God enters our life through that bread and wine. He fills us with his presence. He fills us with his love. He assures us that we have been forgiven, that we are cared for, that we are his children. Just like in that synagogue a long, long time ago, Jesus enters this building and awesome things happen. He casts out the demons that have entered into us and he renews our life and he goes with us. What happens in this place week after week in the 60 minutes we are together, year after year, is God changing our life. We are freed from our sin and he seeks to help us to be more like his people. It might not be dramatic like it was for this man that was possessed, but it happens. And so I love the words and actions and the quiet beauty of many of our worship services. I love this space, the warmth it feels and the serenity. I love that we come together for prayer and praise, that we share the bread and the cup, that we share our concerns with one another, that we confess our sins and together we hear God tell us that we are forgiven and loved. I love coming to this place because this is where God is. This is where things don't just happen like they normally do day after day in my life. This is not a place where I simply go through the motions. This is a place where God invites me to be part of his life, that he can be part of my life. He opens my eyes to confront the spirits that seek to destroy me. He says to them, come out and let me be in control. Worship is a great thing because this is where God is present. Christ speaks a word of freedom 
to every, anything that binds us, anything that holds us down, and the Spirit comes to transform us. So welcome to worship. May today be anything but normal, because as we worship together, we meet God in this place. Here God sets us free from our sin. Here God transforms our lives. Here God says, I am with you. Do not worry. We go forth in power because God goes with us. Amen. And now may the peace of God that goes beyond our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Please stand as our offerings are brought forth. Our, our commitment period um, is, is finished. I want to thank all of you who committed. We sent your commitment cards and returned that. And for all of you for continuing your support of our ministry here at our Savior Lutheran Church. Heavenly Father, these gifts which we return to you were first given by you to us. We return these, Lord, that others may come to, to worship you and to place their trust and their control of their lives over to you rather than trying to keep it all for themselves. Lord, we pray that these gifts be used to your glory. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father of love, you rescued your fallen people with the sufferings and death of Christ, your Son, our brother in flesh. Guide us to know and rejoice in his salvation and to proclaim this gospel with boldness to our brothers and sisters. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of mercy, your compassion has rescued us from the powers of evil and set us free. Guide us to use this liberty to serve others as Christ has served us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of grace, you have provided us with the new life of holy baptism and granted us faith by the power of the Spirit. Keep us in this faith that we may be preserved from evil and delivered from all our enemies to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of truth, you have given us your word that we might know the truth. Provide us good and honest leaders who will heed the voice of your word and protect us from violence so that we may lead peaceful and godly lives without fear. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of comfort, you have borne in your Son all our wounds. According to your will, deliver all who are sick, who suffer, who are troubled in mind, and those near death, that they may be preserved in faith in the day of trouble. Lord, we thank you for Amber's successful surgery. We ask that you would be with her through the recovery process. We also pray for Jenny D. We pray for peace as she awaits lab results. We ask that those results be favorable. Lord, we ask you, too, to help her to, to trust in you and in your love for her. Lord, in your mercy. You are our prayer. Father of hope, you have ended the reign of death by the resurrection of your son. Deliver us from death and grant, that your peace, grant your peace to the dying and your comfort to those who grieve. Be also with those who celebrate life as we remember their birthdays today. We ask that you would be with Ginny Dogert, John Milner, and Jack Doyle. Bless them in the years ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of peace, you have restored us to you and given us a place at the table of your son. Lead us to repentance and strengthen our faith that we who commune at this altar today may be of one faith and receive without hindrance the fruits of his atoning work in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things for which we have prayed and all other things we need, we pray you to grant us in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is good, right, and our duty and delight, Heavenly Father, to bring you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, your Son, 
For you have given us the revelation of your love through him who has become our brother in flesh and by whom salvation has been won. With astonishing power and mercy, he has set us free from the power of evil that we may love, that we may love you above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. Now with the company of heaven and all the heavenly voices, we praise and glorify you now and forevermore singing. gave thanks and broke this bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Take eat as often as possible. If you're communing at your seat, please take and eat the body of Christ for you. And in the same manner also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This cup is the New Testament of my blood shed for you for the remission of all of your sins, this do of all, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you're communing at your seat, take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. We pray the prayer our Lord gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, for all is ready. The Lord has provided this holy meal for you. Lord, I
And now may the eating and the drinking of your Lord's body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. God's peace go with you always. Amen. And we pray, rejoicing in your mercy, we pray that you to pray you to guard and guide us by your spirit, that we who have known with joy the blessings of your mercy in Christ may be kept from all evil and preserved in the righteousness that is ours by faith until the day when we no longer must wrestle against principalities and powers. Grant us to live holy, upright, and godly lives in response to all that you, all your love has accomplished in us and for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just a few things. Um, First, the uh, bags tournament um, is on February 19th and March 5th, right, Karen? Yes. Okay, and, um, and there's sign-up. You can sign up on the link in the user brief. You can also today sign up if you want to do that in the tablets in the Narthex, too, before you leave. Or you can even see Karen and say, I want to throw a bag or two, right? <laughs> okay. Um, special voters meeting on February 11th. Uh, for the purpose of approving the calling of a pastor from seminary. So be sure to attend that. It'll be right after church, so um, it should be fairly quick. But uh, we want to keep everything uh, moving in terms of that, that regard. Um, and then finally, uh, Mel wants to report on our big chili to-do. I promise this is the last time I'm talking about this for a while. <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody who attended and Rock chili or soup or fixings last night. We had about 40 to 50 people, I say, and uh, a half a dozen police officers who were able to stay for quite a while, too, and I think they had a good time. And they appreciated the uh, poster board we all signed going back to their police station to show our loves. Thank you all very much. It was a great time. Well, yeah. I'd like to include that I spoke with one of the Probably work on that too, Mel and, and Elizabeth. Pastor. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.